Hi, I'm Jerry Besson. Welcome to Land of the Beginnings. It is interesting that in the some 200 years of Spanish occupation of this island, there are indeed very few monuments left built by the Spaniards in stone. There's of course Fort San Andres, and there's of course Fort Chacon that we know was once an observatory. Spanish buildings in this part of the Caribbean had about it a sense of impermanence. The British, on the other hand, built in stone. The French settlers introduced a timbered style in the late 18th century, particularly in the estate houses, which had timbered frames and thatch roofs. The English, on the other hand, started to build in stone and brick. It was their way of demonstrating political strength, especially in public buildings. Governor Sir Ralph James Woodford's administration from 1813 to 1829 was a period of both construction and reconstruction in that the town of Port of Spain was being rebuilt after the devastating fire of 1808 as well as being extended and enhanced. Woodford was a handsome man of only 29 years of age when he took up his post in 1813. An old lady more than 20 years ago told the story that he attracted much attention from the pretty little society ladies of the day. She went on to relate how these ladies would promenade in front of his new residence at St. Anne's and shake their bustles for his attention. The city of Port of Spain grew and improved under Sir Ralph's administration. In 1813, just after his arrival, he ordered the footwalks of the town be paved with macadam. He straightened the streets, and their paving was done under the direction of the Surveyor General. Each householder was being assessed for the amount of paving cost he had to bear. There was much grumbling and discontent by the people who were taxed. <laughs> the work done, however, it has stood the test of time. Woodford turned our capital into the most stately town in the West Indies. As traveler Henry Coleridge wrote in 1825, Port of Spain is by far the finest town I saw in the West Indies. The streets are wide, long, and laid out at right angles. No house is now allowed to be built of wood, and no erection of any sort can be made except in a prescribed line. There is a public walk embowered in trees and a spacious marketplace with a market house or shambles in excellent order and cleanliness. The Spanish and French females, their gay costume, their foreign language and their unusual vivacity give this market the appearance of a merry fair in France. This fountain in the middle of Woodford Square today marks a very interesting spot. As you can see, it is a marine Venus, and it was put here towards the end of the 19th century. Woodford Square is an interesting place. It was once called Brunswick Square, named for the Dukes of Brunswick. And can you imagine that entire cathedral there was once built right here? Then it was demolished, and it was taken over there and reassembled. Under Woodford's direction, both Brunswick Square and Marine Square were laid out in 1816. He even imported trees. With the conquest of Trinidad by the British in 1797, the importance of the town grew and its population increased. British architect Philip Reynagle was instructed to design and build a church for the Catholic congregation. On the 24th of March, 1816, with rites fitting the occasion, Governor Woodford laid the foundation stone of the Roman Catholic Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception. Reynagle was also responsible for the design of the Holy Trinity Cathedral. 
History tells us that originally Trinity Church was built of wood and stood at the corner of Prince and Frederick Street. It had been built around 1801 and burnt down in 1808. A new church was built in Woodford Square, then called Brunswick Square, taken down and re-erected in its present position since there had been petitions presented to protest against its erection inside of the square. This cathedral church, built by Ryan Angle, architect in Woodford Stein, who was also responsible for the Catholic cathedral on the other side of town, is a significant Gothic monument. Built in the time of Woodford, it contains two interesting monuments inside. One is a funerary statue designed by the famous person Chantry, and the other is a plaque dedicated to the memory of General Dundas, who made his name in the Battle of the Saints. Woodford supervised the work being done in the town. Mounted on a horse and wearing a large straw hat, he became a familiar sight, getting the name Gouverneur Chapeau-Pie. He was responsible for the purchase of Paradise Estate in 1818, which gave us the Queen's Park Savannah. Botanist David Lockhart was appointed as the first curator of the Botanical Gardens, and he and Woodford laid it out. By the time of his death in April 1829, after 15 years of service, the economy, the efficiency of the militia, the regular and open administration of justice, the general health of the town and cleanness of the streets, buildings and markets, all bore testimony to Woodford's endeavor. I want you to step into the past with me. Step into the past as I come along these really ancient stairs. These stairs here in President's Gardens are among the oldest existing pieces of masonry left in the gardens. They are old and they are well remembered and I want to assure you that they are very well trodden. Besides the improvements in the infrastructure of Trinidad's capital, there was, however, a side to the new governor that was very unwelcome to the island citizens. Woodford was the first civil governor and the first real racist. But Trinidadians fought back and won what is probably the first civil rights case in the new world. Dr. Jean-Baptiste Philippe, was born in the Naparimas in 1796 or 1797. Coming from the background of wealthy colored sugar planters, his family was one of the many of the free coloreds class who had come to Trinidad under the terms of the cedular population of 1783. They were Catholic, had been granted land according to the number of slaves they owned, and had long since established themselves along with their white countrymen as subjects to the Spanish crown. In 1797, Trinidad was captured by the British. Besides the cedular population, the capitulation of 1797 became a most important document with regard to the situation of the free coloreds in Trinidad. Under the cedular population, the document which had created a population for this island in 1783, local people, white and non-white, were granted certain rights. In the Articles of Surrender of 1797, the British had accepted these rights which allowed free blacks and people of color, along with their fellow countrymen of European descent, to inherit property, hold commissions in the local forces, practice professions, and apply to the crown for grants of land. They were also exempt from certain taxes. Many of these free black people were slave-owning proprietors of large sugar estates. In their fifth clause, the Articles of Surrender state that all foreign settlers and their offspring had the right to be admitted to civil service and to the militia. And in its twelfth clause, the capitulation expressly states 
the free colored people who have been acknowledged as such by the laws of Spain shall be protected in their liberty, persons and property like other inhabitants. From young Sir Ralph's world view, all this disorder born out of Trinidad's vicarious origins had to be calmed, structured, ordered and simply made more civilized. It was relatively easy to impose this sense of order upon the cityscape. For example, he removed the tropical rainforest in the immediate vicinity of his new government house at St. Anne's and had a botanical garden planted with imported trees. Trinidad society was a different matter. Free or not free, Woodford did not like to see non-European faces in the legal or medical professions and he definitely did not want them to influence the economy as rich landholders and planters. Since he had no free hand to impose any discriminatory legislation, he passed some perfidious laws. He put a tax on property inherited by illegitimate children, which affected colored children more than whites. And he started to harass several small free colored landowners with a strict crowned land policy. To enforce apartheid, Colored petitioners before the court had to state their color on all legal documents. Seating in theaters was segregated according to skin color, as were ferry seats on the steamer between San Fernando and Port of Spain. Even the earthly remains of the dearly departed had to be buried in two different sections in the cemetery. Woodford stripped the colored educated gentlemen of their being addressed as Mr which doubtlessly confused the employees at Government House tremendously, and so on, and so forth. In his racist fervor, Sir Ralph infringed upon the written law of the cedula and of the capitulation, and this was to be his downfall in the end. But Woodford's neglect of the law of the cedula of population did not go unchallenged. Jean-Baptiste Philippe, who had meanwhile spent his teenage years in England and become a medical doctor, organized a non-violent opposition against Woodford. Quiet collections of signatures for petitions were not sent to the council in Port of Spain, but directly to the government in England. In 1823, Philippe headed a two-man delegation to London and presented the case directly to the colonial office describing how the British governors from Picton to Woodford were abusing the civil rights of the free coloreds of Trinidad. He signed his petition not with his name, but with a free mulatto. Supporting his cause, Jean-Baptiste wrote a book describing the case, entitled An Address to the Right Honorable Earl Bathurst. It is not certain whether this book was actually published in 1824, the year that it was printed, the work might have been published for the first time in 1987 by a Trinidadian publishing company under the title Free Mulatto. The Secretary of State for the Colonies, Lord Bathurst, might not have known of the book in 1829, but he knew of the elaborate petition that Jean-Baptiste Philippe presented him, and he ruled in favor of the thoroughly presented case by the doctor, condemning Sir Ralph Woodward for his actions. Jean-Baptiste Philippe, however, was never to know that he had won the first civil rights case in the New World. Just before the decision of the colonial secretary reached him, he died in 1829 of the young age of only 33 years. Ironically, his adversary Sir Ralph Woodford died in that same year as well. During this time, there was yet another man who sought to alleviate human suffering in Trinidad. It was the dark times of slavery, which had been introduced into Trinidad on a large scale with the cedula of population in 1783. In the half-light of morning, the tall, dark man in Muslim garb made his way quickly through the dirt-covered streets. 
Already the clamor of the market could be heard and the bells of the newly built Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception called for five o'clock mass. As he hurried past an open doorway at the bottom of George Street, his elegant features are backlit beneath his loosely wrapped turban. His name, Johannes Mohammed Bath. Bath quickly crosses the square and enters what would later be called Armen Walk. Now it is merely a long earthen mound known as the Mole, which connects the bottom of the town to a small battery of five guns that date from Spanish times known as Fort St. Andres. In the harbor roads, a slaver swings at anchor in the falling tide. The smell of fish and mangrove also carry with it another odor, the smell of unwashed humanity. The slaves are shackled together wrist to wrist, some tall, some short, some stooped, some bent, some gaping about them, some dribbling from toothless mouths, some shivering in the morning chill. Bath approaches the military sentry and bows somewhat ceremoniously, with just perhaps a touch of irony in the nature of the inclination of his head. What would follow over the next half an hour or so would be unique in these waters. Bath, followed by the sentry, approaches the bedraggled lineup of human misery. An almost inaudible whisper goes from person to person. Salam alaikum, from incomprehensible air to incomprehensible air until towards the end of the line. A wild and tormented eye meets his own calm gaze. Alaikum asalam, gasps the tortured one, his knees already giving way. God is merciful. Already a small crowd is gathering, impatient men with other business to attend to. With practiced eye and probing crop, the chain of human bondage is examined. The auctioneer arrives, and with no ado, the business of the sale of human to human begins. The bidding is bad, the cargo is poor. Bath awaits his turn. A hundred dollars for this fine, strong inhabitant of the Guinea coast. Who will offer a hundred and twenty dollars for the quick and willing villain? The object of the transaction is thrust forward. His quaking frame and pleading eyes and hands make meaningless gestures at no one in particular. A hundred and fifty dollars. A couple of faces turn towards him in surprise, disdain, disapproval. Going once, going twice, do I hear a hundred and seventy-five? No. Gone at a hundred and fifty dollars to Mr. Bath. The morning is now a bowl of light. The guard at the fort is changing as the two men walk out, one tall, reserved, with an old-world dignity, the other whipped and bent, broken, spent, but now in hope. His step is light, and both hands can swing. Johannes Mohammed Bath was a remarkable individual who claimed to be the Sultan of Yulialhad Alimant Animan. He swore on the Holy Quran that he is a prince in his own native land. The Mandingos in Trinidad regarded him as chief priest and patriarch. Bath arrived at a time when Britain and France were at war, and Brigadier General Sir Thomas Hislop who was Trinidad's governor from 1804 to 1811, felt that Republican France would seize the island. Hislop decided to build Fort George above the town, overlooking the Gulf of Paria's western approaches. Bath was among those slaves purchased by the government to build Fort George. Hislop, on observing that Bath was a man of rank among the slaves, put him in charge of the slaves. A wise decision. Bath formed a Mandingo society in Port of Spain and brought together many slaves, Muslims and free black people. This, even before gaining his own emancipation. No one knows when in fact he did obtain his freedom. 
It is known that from at least 1812, Henry Fuller, the Attorney General for 20 years, considered Bath as having the status of a magistrate over his fellow tribesmen and accepted the affidavits from Mandingos which were sworn before Bath. The purpose of Bath's Mandingo Society was to pool resources to buy the freedom of Mandingo slaves. They lived in a particular part of Port of Spain and were bound together by religion, their Mohammedan faith. Known as the Merchant Traders of Africa, the Mandingos came in contact with Muslim societies in the course of their long-distance trading on the African continent. As they scattered in many areas, they became the standard bearers of Islam in the Upper Guinea coast. As traders and Muslims, the Mandingos had considerable advantages over the other tribes in West Africa. The earnings of Bath's Mandingo Society in Port of Spain went towards the purchasing of the freedom of his fellows. Mandingo slaves who were redeemed by the society had to repay the cost. This they did by working for the society. The work of Johannes Bath did not end with the buying of freedom for his people. His vision ultimately included repatriation to Africa. This goal, complicated under British law, was achieved to some degree. Several of his followers did make their way back home, a fantastic achievement for that time. Johannes Mohammed Bath was undoubtedly a hero, not just to Africans, but to all people. His example should be made known to our young, reminding us of all that is good and upstanding in the human condition. In a country like ours, where people have come from all over the world and produce one of the most cosmopolitan societies in possibly the Western Hemisphere, it is very, very important that history should be remembered, history should be taught. Pierre Gustave Louis Bord, 19th century historian, wrote in 1876, ignorance breaks the links of fraternity which exists naturally between children of the same country. No matter what has been said, it is not by erasing history that we arrive at unity. Thank you for watching Land of Beginnings and see you next time.